Um, panels can introduce topics, raise questions, answer questions. Um, and anyone from the audience that would like to ask questions, we highly encourage that. Uh, just come right up to the podium. Uh, you can stand here and uh, interject, and uh, we hope it uh, goes from there. So uh, we'll start. Uh, Dave, why don't you introduce yourself, and we'll go down the line. Hi, I'm Dave Owen. I'm a technical service specialist with BASF, Industrial Pe Petrochemicals Plasticizer Group. I'm also the task group chair for ASTM D207002, the low-level uh, phthalate uh, determination in vinyl task group. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marcy Kinter. I'm the Vice President of Government and Business Information for the Specialty Graphic Imaging Association, or SGIA. I'm here representing those that pay for the tests. I'm that customer base that uh, has to send you the samples and uh, get the test results and to talk a little bit about some of the problems that we're seeing from the test labs as we are getting the phthalate test results back. I'm Bob Altcorn. I'm a senior technical advisor with Intertech. Um, my background is in uh, physical and analytical chemistry. And uh, I, I brought some data regarding our uh, phthalate testing results. Um, if anyone's interested, I, I originally thought we were going to be giving presentations. Hi, my name is Sanjeev Gandhi. I'm technical director for uh, SGS, Consumer Testing Services, uh, based in New Jersey. Uh, I'm a technical team lead for a group of about eight people who are product sector uh, experts uh, in different areas that we are involved in. What does that mean? I spend all day in meetings. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll give you guys some seed questions and try and get the ball rolling. Uh, you know, we're very curious. Uh, our method allows for a number of different methods. Uh, there's, as we've seen today, there's constantly new technologies and methods coming out. Um, we're curious uh, as far as uh, method comparisons. Uh, why do you like one method over another? Do you see certain advantages over uh, ways you do it versus way you see other people do it? Um, Anything along those lines that I could give people more perspective of, of what advantages and disadvantages we have to look for in different methods. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think somebody mentioned earlier today, uh, you know, uh, GCMS, uh, the, which is the existing method widely used, is the benchmark against which we are going forward. Uh, uh, both in terms of the level of uh, speciation we need uh, to really segregate those banned uh, phthalates and whether they are within the regulatory, uh, below the regulatory limits, uh, uh, that's what needs to be confirmed or validated through the testing. Uh, a lot of the technologies that we heard about today, uh, certainly very exciting. Uh, we haven't really heard about uh, those technologies in a forum like this before. Uh, uh, I don't happen to go to PitCon every year, so maybe that's my limitation. Uh, but uh, it's, but it looks very exciting. Uh, I think w one thing that sur surprised me during the uh, sessions earlier today was nobody asked uh, after those exciting uh, 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 technologies uh, and as they were being described. Uh, nobody asked, "Are we there yet?" So. So I think that's the question we need to answer. Uh, certainly that's the question that I'm hearing uh, because I just came from Orlando at the Expo conference uh, that was taking place. I met a lot of customers uh, that work with test labs uh, and, uh, and the cost is a concern to them and they are looking for a solution. I think Marcy will talk more about that and perhaps more forcefully than I would. <laughs> but. Uh, Basically, that's uh, where the plastic meets the, the road. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we'll get uh, to hear about that uh, through the rest of the discussion today. Um, we're primarily, again, uh, using GCMS spec. Um, we've also uh, certainly are sensitive to the cost of this. Um, we have a number of concerns um, about some of the uh, the methods that are proposed 
Um, certainly, for example, FTIR has been used in plastics additives analysis for, for quite a long time. I mean, the most sensitive analysis is uh, through transmission, typically through thin or thick films. Um, we, we tried to see uh, in preparation for this meeting, you know, where are we seeing failures? And hopefully, you know, this would provide some guidance on, on ways to move forward. Um, so we did a kind of a, a long, large sample survey of failures and then a um, more recent, smaller scale survey of extent of uh, I shouldn't say failure, non-compliances. So over, over several years, we're seeing a um, non-compliance rate of on the order of 4%. And um, in many cases, I would say in most cases, these involve plastics that are not identified to us by the customer. So in some cases, you can tell what the plastic is easily, certainly if it's PVC. Um, in some cases, it's more difficult, but, you know, one of our, I'd say one of our goals would be to um, make sure that, you know, screening techniques or, or um, improved um, quantification techniques are compatible with the types of materials that are, um, you know, actually showing up where, as, as non-compliances. Um, based on a shorter... Um, survey of non-compliances, we found about half in, in recent months were in the 0.1 to 1 percent range. So if you look at earlier data, including published data, it indicates, you know, a much higher um, level of phthalates. But in, based on our recent data, uh, getting to low levels is more important. Um, DHP was the Phthalate that was present the most, and DINP second. Uh, I guess some general concerns we had about screening methods in particular. One that was already addressed, uh, the general lack of um, certified reference materials or standard reference materials, like how do you, um, how do you know your, your uh, analytical analytical technique is performing as it should be, and, and um, Dr. Dreyfus pointed out that there is, a, I guess, a vinyl, um, sorry, polyethylene um, uh, SRM in, pre in preparation. Um, other concerns are at, Certainly with the spectroscopic methods, in, in practice, pretty much all polymers contain additives. So these, in addition to plasticizers, they might be fillers, colorants, flame retardants, stabilizers, lubricants. Um, so can you identify those? Do they cause interference problems with, you know, the phthalates? Um, are some of our... Con Customers have raised issues of, um, you know, how do you test um, small small area um, samples, or say a design on a on a product that's very small? Can you can you get the spatial resolution? Um, right now, you can do compositing to at least in some cases reduce cost. Is that a possibility with the screening methods? Is it needed as a possibility? Uh, I think a lot of the potential solutions um, presented here today are very specific to individual pieces of equipment. And uh, we certainly don't have any problem with that, but it, based on what we read in preparation for this meeting, you know, when you have something like FTIR, well, there, there are a lot of different sampling techniques. There are a lot of different uh, qualities of FTIR instruments. I mean, it's been commercially available since, uh, say, 1979, 1978. Um, is everyone, you know, it's, is, is my old FTIR going to be as good as your new FTIR? To what extent does the um, technique depend on operator experience? And I think that was also addressed by 
um, some of the presenters today. Anyway, those are, were our, our potential, uh, at least, questions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are the issues that we're most concerned about going forward. And I, I would say that, you know, if, if anybody here is interested in working with us, then, you know, please let me know, because we're, we're looking for a solution, and we would like to work with you on these and other issues. Well, to qualify, I'm not a chemist and do not have a chemical background. Uh, but I will say, based on the feedback, and I'm talking primarily about ink manufacturers that have to get their products tested because they contain phthalates. And obviously the goal is to get the banned phthalates out of the products and you have to replace them with something. Uh, there has to be some functionality that's still in that product in order for it to perform as everyone expects it to. And we've really seen that's been one of the bigger issues. We've also seen that there's little stability between testing labs in the results. Uh, we have one company that indicates that they just don't even have a confidence rate in their lab. They don't see that the test results are coming back verifiable. And that to us is very troubling. We see that false positives are an ongoing problem. We also see that some of our uh, alternatives that we're using are coming back and failing. Because, and I will be honest with you, that whole portable technology that just goes red and green scares me to death. Because we're not looking to ban anything more than those six phthalates, and that's my policy issue right now, is that we're really looking to only take out those six. And I believe, quite honestly, when I was listening to the chap, that went on a week ago, was it a week ago? They were also discussing whether or not they could issue or recommend interim bans on other phthalates that were not of the six, and they were told that no, that was really not an option. So I want to be very clear that when you start talking about portable technology that just does a red or a green based on total phthalate concentration, you're really talking about a disruption in the, in the market chain. And that truly, truly is an issue. We have one company that estimates that on an annual basis they may pay up to $5.5 million in testing a year. $5.5 million, and they took the phthalates out of their products. So they are now testing products that have none of the six banned phthalates in them. So that's just a whole other issue. So when you start looking at some of the resolutions, I, I agree with my colleague here on the panel, rather than rushing forward and looking at alternative testing uh, techniques such as the portable handheld, I'd really like to see some of the issues that we're seeing with the test method resolved before moving forward. Specifically looking at and making sure that some of the, uh, I guess, replaced phthalates are not seen as those that are banned so that when we start looking at reformulation, we're actually doing what the legislation asked us to do, which is to take the six band phthalates out and to reformulate. We've also found within the, the testing labs that and uh, there does seem to be a requirement that there, it, when you are looking at the introduction of an alternative phthalate, that there has to be some sort of manual integration done and there has to be extra steps taken that not all labs, testing labs, are willing or able to do. So there has to be that extra step, so that rather than just going pass-fail, they're actually taking a look at the product and making sure that, with the knowledge and understanding of what's in that actual sample, they're able to differentiate and hopefully to pass a product that does not contain any of the six-band phthalates above the limit. We also find that the tests differ based on the labs. We will send one sample to one lab and it will pass, and we will send the ex identical sample to another lab and it will fail. So that also is very, very um, concerning to us as a customer base, because we're looking at, you know, $375 a test, and when you go up to your final customer and then they require you to continue to test, and one lab fails and one lab passes, it gets to be a very expensive proposition. And again, this is 
one of the elements that we really haven't touched upon here today is the whole element of the cost of the testing and the fact that if you do not have a test method that adequately looks at the product and adequately delineates whether or not you have a good, as I say, a good or a bad phthalate, then you continue to have to test. And it is, does get extremely costly. And we are not talking about multi-million dollar companies that have that kind of money to continue to use. Uh, so those are just some of the, the issues that, that we're seeing when we send out samples to the testing community. We uh, did see, obviously, January 1, the testing cost just about doubled, as we expected they would for both lead and phthalate. Uh, so we are concerned, because we would like to see that before we move forward with other sorts of testing um, opportunities like handheld, that we would actually take a look at the current testing methodology and make sure that it is accurate and that we are not penalized for doing what, quite honestly, Congress asked us to do, which is to remove the banned phthalates from our products. Well, I'm going to talk from the ASTM perspective. Um, I agree with you. Uh, some labs had very different results, and that's why I volunteered to uh, start to develop a method within ASTM. Um, we're not focused solely on GC mass spec type methods, but that's the one that comes out with the best results. We basically have, um, we've done two round robins with basically four different techniques, and we went, when we looked at variability, we found the thermal desorption method uh, came out with the least amount of variability, so that's the one we decided to write a method on. We will probably also write a uh, method based on solvent extraction, and then, you know, again, we're not limited to just GC mass spec. Uh, I would like to also mention we do have a meeting, a task group meeting, April 16th, which everyone is um, invited to participate in. You can go to ASTM.org and look up D20 meetings and see where that is and the timing. Um, just following up on, on some of those ideas, uh, first of all, I did want to clarify to Bob uh, what, uh, in terms of the SRMs that are available, there is a polyethylene uh, certified reference material that's available currently, and what we're working with NIST for is to develop the PVC SRM, so that's in development. Um, but uh, one of the questions that I have is in dealing with um, uh, impurities or contamination within the uh, manufacturing process. Uh, I think uh, in one of our first uh, talks this morning, somebody brought this up. Uh, certainly it can be an issue in the laboratory, but, uh, and in the labs we were fairly familiar with how to, how to deal with uh, contamination issues. In, uh, in the manufacturer, and I, I think maybe uh, Dave and, and Marcy may have some uh, insight into this as well as m maybe some of the uh, uh, attendees. Um, it seems to me that, you know, using perhaps some of these uh, screening methods that we've been talking about could be a valuable tool in, in your shops, uh, whether uh, the, you know, master batch and, and concentrate beads that are used to add color or add uh, other additives to a, a product might have phthalates in them, and if you're adding a 1% drop rate of a of a master batch that's got 30% phthalates in it, you're going to get the sort of low levels that Bob was talking about. Um, or, or similarly, in an ink uh, vehicle uh, like Marcy was talking about, if there's, uh, you know, again, if if there's an additive to that uh, ink that contains a, uh, a phthalate or something. What experience do you have in either, you know, the existence of that problem or in, in quality assurance methods within your shops to, to deal with that? Well, we're seeing that the ink manufacturers are taking steps to develop their own reasonable testing programs. So that, similar to what you're asking the children's product manufacturers to do, which is to develop a reasonable testing program with periodic testing, 
they are looking to develop their own reasonable testing programs based on the supplies coming in. So we start to see that they are now testing the raw materials and taking a look at what's coming in so that they can adequately determine whether or not there's any contaminants in that product. We're also starting to see that some of the ink manufacturers are totally, totally segregating the manufacturing of their phthalate versus non-phthalate ink systems. And oftentimes, if they decide to go non-phthalate, which is, and that's a whole big controversial issue, is what is phthalate free and how do you advertise it. Uh, when we look at those that have opted to take the six phthalates out, and we're only talking about the six phthalates right now, uh, they oftentimes will take it out of all their products eventually, so that, that they don't have any of that material in their facility whatsoever. We see that they are doing extensive QA, QC programs. We see that they are establishing their own reasonable testing programs to ensure the integrity of their raw materials. And this gets into a whole big issue when we start talking policy side-wise, which I know we're not here to do today, when we start looking at how far can we extend the term batch manufacturing. Uh, because when they start to look at the QC, um, QA of their raw materials, they really want to make sure that they don't have to keep testing every time they make a batch of ink. So we are looking at what we can do to ensure that the ink does have that integrity from the testing point of view, but it's not over, overly burdensome for the ink manufacturer because it does have that ripple effect within the marketplace. Does that answer um, a little bit about what you were looking at? I'm just talking from the ink manufacturer's point of view. From the end user, now the ink I'm talking about is that ink that goes on your T-shirts. We are talking about the plastisol-based ink that goes on your T-shirts. So you are talking about textile or garment decorators. What we are finding in uh, some of the garment decorators that I've been dealing with only print children's products. And even though uh, it doesn't apply, it only applies in the textile world to child care articles, you know, under three, facilitate eating and sleeping, uh, a lot of them are opting to take it up to that next level and go all the way up to 12. And that is purely their own personal um, desire because it's easier for them to have one ink system within their operation rather than running two. Uh, I have talked to some textile manufacturers, some textile houses that will purchase and test ink and we'll put it on the shelf and say this is only for children's products. So they clearly label it that this is done and tested for children's products. Uh, and then they obviously clean everything that they, they have a dedicated print line just for that sort of technology. So we are starting to see that the, the manufacturers are also taking steps to put some QA, QC into their operation based on not only their customer base but also based on their incoming materials. <coughs> Well, uh, depending on how you're making your diesters, um, there's a couple of techniques that we would use. Uh, if it's a non-phthalate and we're uh, sensitive about it, we would use UV Viz because the uh, benzene ring is very absorbent and you pick it up rather quickly. And a lot of the other non-phthalates don't have a benzene ring. Um, then we would use GC and then GC mass spec. Uh, I think for finished articles, um, the FTIR as a screening tool is very good because phthalates are very distinctive with FTIR. It's uh, just that it's a general test and uh, it's not uh, overly as quantitative as GC mass spec. I, I just wanted to follow up one, one more thing from Dave. Um, in, in your alternative uh, phthalates that are out there, I, I know you, you've worked in the manufacturer, um, to what extent is there, might there be an issue of contamination, I'm not saying with BASF in particular, but with the industry, of having, you know, say, a, a, some of one of the banned phthalates in one of the other phthalates due to the manufacturer? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it depends on um, what you're making in your plant. And um, if you're making phthalates along with the non-phthalates, yeah, you're going to run the risk of some cross-contamination. I think you can get cross-contamination from uh, tank trucks as well, customers piping. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole chain of events or uh, 
shipping events that can cause you to get contamination from just the plasticizer. And just to add to that, uh, you know, in, in manufacturing process, other than the raw material uh, uh, quality check, uh, you know, material handling equipment, even just the liner in a drum that is, uh, you know, used for your pallets and stuff like that, resin, so that plastic liner in that drum can also introduce contamination. Uh, I'm Seth Hansen. I'm a consultant in the consumer products industry doing quality systems and so on. <clears throat> Everything I'm hearing here is about contained systems. Take it into the manufacturing area. I'm involved in a, in a project right now with 400,000 units of wallets. Inserts in wallets, BVC insert. They mixed when it came in, and we were able to, f we were able to figure this out with some, with some testing that when the product came in, came in from two different sources. One had phthalates at about 20%. The other was clean. They're put on the shelf together in the heat of Asia. All of a sudden now, and to your point, what is happening now is you have products in the system that have 20%, and you have products, some products in the system that have 1,000 ppm, 1,200 ppm, you set it together for a day, you set it together for a week, you have a problem. Part of this whole thing on phthalates, because of the migration issue, you need to look at the whole manufacturing process and set up, that's what my clients are asking me to do, give me a process from beginning to end of isolation. And it goes as far as I have a situation, screen prints. <clears throat> lead, lead was found, it's, but the same thing as phthalates, but lead was found in it. I traced it back. The screen print was done in Vietnam. They cleaned the screens with gas. There was lead in the gas. We have the same situation with phthalates. There is mixing of chemicals. You have BASF, good chemicals. Chinese, and they mix them dollars and cents. So I think we need to look at the whole process and to the point of using the portable, and that's what I'm involved in because I'm using that. With the, by using the portable, I'm able to save a $4 million project that was going to have to be burned, literally burned, through the analysis of instead of just doing one, I've done over 300 analysis in three days and able to sort and sort things out. So it's, we have to work together, the labs and the quality systems out in the field. And I would, I would agree, but I don't, what I don't want to see is that the portable system because, becomes the be all and end all. Because if you have a portable system at a retail operation and it comes back that there's phthalates in there, however, they've taken all the phthalates out and they can show through their component part testing and they can show through their general conformity certificate that they meet all the requirements, then you're sending that manufacturer through hoops that don't necessarily need to be sent through. So I agree it is a melding of, of all aspects that have to come together, but first, and foremost, we need to take a look at the testing methodologies to determine why some of the, the phthalates that are not banned are showing up within the tests and what can be done. And is there something else, some other policy, some other steps that need to be uh, put out there so that these phthalates that they are using, because we need some plasticizers in these inks, I'm sorry, but we need them in the inks to make them work, we somehow have to have a testing methodology that does reward those manufacturers who have taken the step to get the six-band phthalates out and are using alternative phthalates. And that's really the crux of the issue because when it comes back as a failed test because of the low limits and because we're not, we have not adopted a risk-based standard and be, they continually have to test even if they no longer have those materials in their products. 
So th that's, it's an underlying problem that needs to be addressed. And if it can be addressed through an ASTM test method that looks at alternative methodologies to get to the result, that's great. But the underlying concern is the manufacturers that have taken the step to really reformulate their products and they're, they still have that, that stick over them where they continually need to uh, confirm that they have met the standard, but they're being penalized because the testing methodology erroneously identifies the phthalate. What I would like to add to that point is that uh, for the ink application industry, if that's the right description, uh, you know, you'll have the choice uh, based on what they've described in the, under the ASTM initiative, you'll have options of the methods and that Mm -hmm. uh, one solution won't fit all. Right. So you'll have the choice of applying the solution that works for the ink industry applications, provided CPSC blesses that method and approves it. Right, as long as it attacks the underlying problem that we're seeing. I mean, that's, that's the crux of the issue. If the testing methodology, even, a, even as it's, it's developed by ASTM, does not attack that underlying issue, then we haven't gained anything, regardless of the testing methodology that we choose. Uh, I would just like to point out that we had, uh, I think, uh, three or four different uh, presentations today talking about the quality assurance within the existing testing mechanisms to properly identify those chemicals. Uh, and we've seen it in our lab. It's very easy to do uh, when it's done the way that uh, Dr. Dreyfus described, that. Uh, uh, our, our friends uh, from the other uh, uh, manufacturers described. But it's not being done consistently within the testing community, and that's what we're seeing, is that it's, it's there's a, there might be there's a lack of direction by CPSC or something, but we're, we're not seeing, we're, we're seeing a lack of consistent failed results on products that should not be failing. And that's, that is, getting to be a very costly issue within the industry. Do you have any statistics about the... <laughs> yeah, just a question. Do you have any statistics about the numbers of failures that occur and, and uh, all these all false positives or are they just misidentification? Or? Uh, I don't think in the ones that are coming back failed and I'd have to go back and see. Uh, I would imagine that my members are keeping statistics only because it's a ROI issue. Yeah. We're, uh, and I can provide that for the record if people would like to see that. I don't think it's a misidentification because they've taken the banned ones out. So it's not like they, they say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have this in, and then it's coming back saying it does. If it does, it might be, as we've mentioned here, an impurity. Uh, but I've had manufacturers that tell me they now will uh, ship their products in tin foil. They do not let any plastic touch their product. I mean, they really do take steps now to ensure that there's no migration between any sort of plastic and that sample before it gets to the lab. I mean, these are the steps that, that are being taken. However, they're not being taken by uh, the, the garment decoration community, so now we're starting to develop some, uh, I guess, uh, recommendations for printers that want to send their products off because if you know, their pro if the ink manufacturer's test comes back and it passes and then it fails on the part of the screen printer, then we have to look at the manufacturing process, obviously. And then we're also looking at the way that they ship the product off to be tested because we're seeing the migration, as we've mentioned here, in, even in the buckets and, you know, in the, in the developing. But that, I'd be happy to, to pull together some statistics and let everyone know. Uh, so I was going to pose this, uh, so now that we have you uh, here and you have a forum, um, directly to us, I guess the question uh, I'd ask is, ideally, what does the testing community need for a lot of these issues that we brought up today? Uh, what would it take to either cut costs, get better results, make things more consistent? Um, 
whether it's practical or, or way down the road, uh, what do you want from CPSC or from the in, uh, manufacturers of different analytical technologies or instruments? Uh, what would you like to see in the future to, to make everyone's life uh, easier? Well, from the standpoint of consistency, I mean, interlaboratory studies are, you know, the, the proven way to do this. Um, it would certainly help to have reference materials, you know, with different additives or different matrices based on um, what what's actually, you know, where the phthalates are actually being detected and the quantities in which they're actually being detected. Um, there are some voluntary um, uh, interlaboratory studies that are being run, you know, in Europe, for example. But that, I think, is the the uh, most, the, the, you know, the standard way to address um, that issue. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we we uh, all came to an agreement that the sample preparation is the the area where there's an opportunity for uh, making better economy of this method. Uh, so uh, this is something uh, uh, we realized as well maybe uh, two, three years ago when we started looking into this uh, alternate methods. Uh, uh, we, we have our own R&D team at, within SGS, uh, and we worked on uh, uh, thermal desorption uh, Technique. Uh, I, we have had some contact with uh, with Bob, uh, who presented uh, his uh, work uh, in this area and how far it has progressed now under the ASTM uh, uh, D20 committee. So I think we recognize that as a, a, a positive uh, move forward. Uh, I'm really glad to hear that that's one of the methods that you found uh, to have least amount of variability. Uh, and just to give you some perspective, you know, uh, in our studies, you know, we were able to analyze uh, within 15 minutes the total runtime using that technique with little sample prep. Uh, another advantage is, especially with uh, coatings, uh, you know, uh, very small sample size is needed. So some of the practical issues uh, that come up uh, when you have products with very small coverage area and you need you, have, you heard the proverbial example of 200 Barbie dolls, uh, so in case of lead testing, but basically it's the same issue that when you have very small s coverage in some certain products, you know, that disadvantage goes away with the use of this method. Uh, you can use it for solid as well as uh, liquid samples. Uh, uh, and the recovery values were very high, uh, you know, within the, the norms of the analytical world. Uh, so we are very excited about that, uh, and obviously ASTM uh, approval of that method would also give further impetus to the use of that uh, technology. Uh, there are a couple of other areas that we, we have looked into. IAMS is something that wasn't, uh, I know it was on your list, but it wasn't discussed uh, uh, by any of the presenters today. We have looked at uh, IAM, ion attachment mass spectroscopy. Uh, uh, we have worked under the IEC group, which has been looking at it uh, from the raw side of uh, the testing requirement uh, in Europe. Uh, we have R&D team working in Germany closely with the IEC team. And uh, we found some issues uh, that really uh, don't address uh, the kind of uh, problems, uh, the uh, practical problems in uh, regulatory compliance uh, needs. Uh, uh, for toys and children's products. Uh, the chromatic graphic separation of, uh, you know, molecules with identical mass is definitely one problem. Sample homogeneity is a problem. Uh, we also looked at DART, and uh, same sample homogeneity could be a problem, uh, you know. So those are some of the issues uh, that are still uh, need to be resolved. But then there's another much bigger uh, practical problem that really does not solve the cost of uh, the methodology. It's th very expensive. We looked at uh, systems from different vendors, you know, 
front up capital cost of four hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. So, so I'm really uh, glad to hear some of the developments about uh, in handheld uh, portable technology that uh, was discussed today. Uh, this is something that needs to be validated in the real world. Uh, there was some limited data presented today. It may not be a solution for everybody, uh, but it could be something to look at in different environments uh, for screening purposes as intended. Yeah, um, sample homogeneity is, um, is always a big problem. I think the newer technologies have heightened the awareness of this when it comes to lead. So um, one of the things you want to watch out for, for the, you know, these technologies that are surface sensitive, like, um, you know, the FTIR, ATR techniques and the DART techniques, you know, are you, is your sample homogeneous on a depth, uh, through a depth profile? Uh, certainly if you're looking, for example, at um, pellets, well, sometimes pellets have lubri lubricants on them, so the, what's on the surface is not necessarily the same thing as what's in the interior. Um, I mean, these are problems that can certainly be solved, but it, it, I think it's important to be aware of them. Um, I have a question for Dave uh, about the uh, developing ASTM method. Uh, Bob spoke, of course, about the, the technology uh, from the point of view of, uh, of Frontier, uh, but he alluded to uh, the, uh, the other uh, instrument manufacturers out there, uh, CDS, Gerstle, et cetera, and that there, there being slight differences in uh, temperatures and things like that for that. Is, is your method addressing that to make it uh, universal across thermal desorption uh, equipment? Uh, well, the method hasn't been approved, but yes, we will address that. We're nearing 3 o'clock, so uh, there's anyone else I'd like to ask a question. Now's the time. So uh, I, I guess my first question would be um, to Bob. Um, in your preparation for the GC mass spec analysis, what is your biggest um, consuming problem? I mean, do you ever encounter problems where you would like to screen before you do that? To, to avoid uh, a costly problem. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, certainly a technique that, you know, could identify, if it, you have a really quick technique can I, that could identify those materials that are failing by a large margin, um, that would potentially eliminate, you know, some necessity to do testing. Um, I, all of the GC mass, you know, mass spec methods are much more time consuming than, um, certain, you know, the 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 um, FTIR or or ambient um, <coughs> mass spec techniques that were here. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I mean that. That would be helpful potentially by eliminating, you know, testing on um, materials that failed by a large margin. Okay. Uh, but I get. I mean, you, we would potentially have to look at the actual numbers of um, products by material class to see to what extent that would, you know, save testing time and cost. Right. Right. So from, from our FTIR perspective, um, you know, the way I see it is we have two different routes. You know, we can go for the screening, but we also have the potential to do um, a liquid solid extraction um, using a solvent. And there's me ASTM methods already out there for doing that in, in other materials. Um, is that a potential route? Or, or is it, is it going to be a barrier for that? Again, I, well, I mean, the, people discuss the extraction processes here. Um, 
and they can be time consuming. I, you know, they rain typically. The sonication processes are running in the, you know, half hour range, but um, depending on the specified extraction procedure from the, uh, identified in the, you know, test method, uh, the extraction might be the time consuming step or, you know, time limiting step and it might not be. I mean, it probably um, depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at raw material that's a plastisol, that's already a liquid, so mm -hmm. potentially that's a lot easier than something that um, is difficult to extract. Okay. Um, no, that answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I'd like to just follow up on that with Marcy. Uh, do, do you see uh, where perhaps uh, uh, some in your in your uh, uh, industry might use a, a technique like one of these uh, screening devices to to look at the incoming? You know, they've specified the uh, a phthalate alternative in their uh, uh, plastisol, and to to check that that. You know, are, are, are the scope and size of these uh, uh, companies big enough to do that sort of thing? I guess it would depend on the cost of the handheld. I mean, I'm not sure what the cost of the handheld is for the lead, and they're not using one of those. Uh, primarily in the industry sector, uh, a typical size is 25 employees, so you're not looking at huge companies. Uh, so. Quite honestly, what they're looking at and what they want is they want the ink manufacturers to certify through component part testing that their inks are compliant. And that is really not occurring right now uh, because of the costs associated with the tests on, from the ink manufacturer's point of view. The definition or lack of clarity of definition as to what is batch manufacturing uh, and also with the, the fact that we're seeing so many um, false positives come back on the alternatives. So it's, it's a mixed bag. I really don't see that they would, unless it was a really large um, garment decoration house, that they would invest in handheld. They really are just going to look to their suppliers to certify or they're going to send out to a lab themselves. Because quite honestly, eventually, because they're providing a children's product, they're going to have to test anyway, or at least provide some sort of testing documentation through component part testing that their product complies with all the lead and phthalate content limits. So I don't really see handheld as being, um, I see that happening more at the, the retail level, to be honest with you. Um, my name's Pat Sells. I've got 30 years experience selling x-ray to include portable x-ray and I'm no longer in the x-ray business I'm in the ramen business now the portable but one of my clients um, down in North Carolina they were spending hundred thousand dollars a month on testing sending samples out just for lead and they did buy a portable x-ray from me at the time when I worked for another outfit they spent forty thousand dollars for that piece of equipment but they reduced their monthly output of samples they were sending out as a result of screening down to about $10,000 a month. If they found any indication of lead at all in screening, they did not attempt to put a number on it. That went out to be tested by the holy grail methods of ICP and AA and everything else, which we don't compete with. We, we readily admit that those techniques are superior. But in an attempt to limit the volume of samples that you're sending out, there is a role for the screening, and while we're not here today to talk about lead, I think the screening for the phthalates will play a similar type of role, and it is a way for manufacturers to reduce cost. Uh, this was a particular site where the lead was showing up in inks. It was showing up in zippers. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of cases where there was co conflicts in analysis where the commercial lab was coming back saying there wasn't any lead. We were saying there was lead. It wasn't a fact that the commercial lab did anything wrong. We analyzed two different pieces of metal. They were taking the zipper pool and, and dissolving it in acid. We were looking at the zipper pool, but we were looking at the base of the zipper, which is leaded brass, and we were seeing the lead. They were not seeing the lead in, in the zipper. 
in the pool. So um, it's really not a question that we're wrong and they're right, they're right and we're wrong. It's a question of the sampling. Right. Are you looking at the same piece of material? Mm -hmm. And so on. All right. Now, I would agree that there is a role. It depends on how large the operation is and their volume. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're looking at a traditional garment decorator, especially in the area of phthalates, and again, the, tra the, the unwritten definition is under three, <coughs> facilitating eating and sleeping, there's not a lot of that actually being printed, believe it or not. A lot of it's embroidered, which is exempt because it's not, it's not a plasticized component. But when you start looking at zippers and things of that nature, then yes, it does make sense to have some sort of a handheld technology. But it does depend on the size of the facility. But if you know, you're looking at your average facility that you're going to go to to buy t-shirts for your local soccer team, no, they're not going to have any sort of handheld. No, but potentially you're spending as much in one month as what one of these analyzers costs. Yeah, so, but they're not um, going to send out every, they're not going to send out every product. They're going to look at their ink systems and they'll send out their ink systems. And as mm -hmm. long as they don't change their ink systems, then they're fine. They don't yeah. have to get it retested. So I, you're, you're not, you know, it, it is a fine line. But quite honestly, the, the, the size of the facility does dictate what they're going to do. Yeah. And we also don't. Yeah, SGIA does not say you have to send every product out to get tested. You have to make sure that product complies. If you can use component part testing and send out a sample of your ink, then that test stands until you use up that ink. Sure. So it really is a, it's a very much a cost issue. But again, the, the, the industry is looking to their ink manufacturers to provide them with that assurance. But I would still argue that screening techniques are one of the best methods to reduce your cost. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't disagree. It depends on the size of the facility right. and the amount of volume that they do. Right. If you're doing a million dollars, I'm not sure. One more thing. All of this, this is CPSC meeting. I have not heard anything about Prop 65. And Prop 65 is the big gorilla in the room. And <clears throat> Prop 65 does not dispitiate between children and others. And if you look at what is going on right now with the number of 60 notices that have been filed, and it's only an indicator of what's going on. Um, <laughs> so phthalates, <laughs> we have to come up with some ways in the whole process of taking care of the phthalates and making sure they're not in there. Well, we've been dealing with Prop 65 for years. That's a California regulation, by the way. Um, do we have any last uh, uh, questions? Hey, come on up. Uh, I just have a question about the um worked on now. Um, are there any plans for uh, doing some kind of interlaboratory study to try and um, possibly develop a uh, correction factor that would be applied? A correction factor for what? Well, if you look in uh, the ASTM F963, which is the toy standard, um, there is um, testing that's specified for heavy metals uh, in the coatings. And um, I guess they must have done a, um, an interlaboratory study to determine what kind of variability there is be between labs. And for each of the heavy elements, there's a certain correction factor that's to be applied. Um, I think it's anywhere between 5 and 30%. Um, well, I'm going to talk in a slightly different terminology. Once a method is developed and approved, you do have to do a statistical analysis. And we've basically done two interlab studies already um, with a vinyl that was compounded, but it was not, um, I'll say, made to all the ASTM requirements. It was just to see how the different techniques would work. So the next iteration, once 
a method is approved is to do an interlaboratory study with a sample and then provide the statistical analysis. Okay. And one other question, um, Sanjeev, you just you wanted to uh, bring in on that. You know, uh, speak to that correct and fa correction factor question you just asked. Uh, I think you are referring to the correction factor uh, that is applied for the weighing error that could occur when you're compositing different materials. I think you were right. talking about the F963 heavy metals, it has a subtraction. Right, I mean, the, there is a, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, uh, let me just uh, point out, so ASTM F963 is the, the toy standard, and in, in its uh, section uh, 4.3, I think it is, on uh, uh, six heavy metals and paints, and now in the new uh, uh, 2011 version in uh, substrates as well, it applies a correction factor that essentially subtracts off a uh, percentage from the result. Um, this was a consensus standard that is, you know, giving a, a discount, if you will, to the measured values uh, as part of the standard. Uh, the, the standard, in, in this case, uh, of 0.1 percent of the six, the three permanently banned phthalates and the three uh, temporarily banned phthalates, uh, was set by, by Congress, and it's not uh, I don't think it's uh, ASTM's purview to, to set that standard. Right. Thank you. And uh, one other question. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about, um, because of the phthalate regulation, um, essentially phthalates as a plasticizer will, within a few years, are going to be totally absent from the marketplace. Is that, there any truth to that? Um, or is that just um, mythology? Um, I think what I would say is most of the vinyl is not compounded in the United States. And, uh, you know, 50%, about 50% is in uh, Asia. And in Asia, the predominant plasticizers are phthalates. In the U.S., the predominant plasticizers are, are phthalates, and in Europe, I think the predominant plasticizers are phthalates. There are new plasticizers coming out. It's pretty much been an explosion, but I would not say it's years. It might be decades if it happens at all. Thank you. I'd like to uh, just clarify a few of the things about the ASTM method. There is a section in there that, uh, that requires a, the user to use evolved gas analysis. And evolved gas analysis basically will define the temperature range over which that particular piece of equipment works best. So if the Frontier system moves 100 to 320, it may be with manufacturer B, they may be going from 120 to 340. So there's a, there's a section in there that discusses using evolved gas analysis and extracted ions to identify the temperature range over which that piece of equipment operates to extract the phthalates. And I should mention that one of the round robins that Dave mentioned was done by a series of laboratories that had nothing to do at all with our committee. So I just went out in the free world and found five people, five laboratories willing to take these samples and see what they could get. And the percent difference for all the laboratories for all the numbers, and we looked at six phthalates, three different injections, a large number of data. And the percent difference, or percent error, I'm sorry, for all the numbers from all the laboratories for all the replicates was about 12 percent. So we are, we are proceeding down the path that they've mentioned. We've got one more round to do. Throw that one <laughs> what we have to do is train that, that analyst a little bit more before she gets the samples. <laughs> no, but it brings up a good point. One guy out of six failed, would have failed the test. See, I don't know if she failed. She, yeah. she, she's 30% high on every number. Yeah. There's something in there, but I can't find it. <laughs> no, I was just curious. Uh, the other gentleman started this question. So um, I know earlier I heard the mention of non-phthalate non plasticizers, and I was curious, is there a list of 
non phthalate plasticizers on the market right now that are like available and affordable or uh, is that not really the case just out of curiosity on my part I don't know too much about the plasticizer uh, I'll refer that question back to the EPA design for the environment committee that I mentioned in my first talk that's one of their target goals is to bring up the different phthalates what their possible repercussions could be um, I'm sure cost is going to be a factor that comes into that there, is a, there was a study done by Institute, uh, I can't, uh, I don't remember the full name, uh, STURI in Massachusetts. Uh, it was done uh, almost 10, 15 years ago, uh, which looked at non phthalate plasticizers and also looked at the cost implications uh, going back 15 years ago. I can forward you that research paper if you want. Uh, yeah. Okay, one part of the ASTM task group is to compile all the plasticizers that are used in vinyl and also provide mass spectra on that. Um, I'm also going to mention something as an aside because the um, uh, Society of Plastics Engineers has a vinyl division and they're going to have a regional technical conference in October and there will be a, a bunch of presentations on non phthalate plasticizers there and that's in the middle of October you can go to SPE dot I think it's SPE for you dot org or something like that uh, uh, thank you I think well, this has been a, a really good uh, uh, seminar this was our first uh, chemistry symposium that we've had here at our new lab uh, but I understand some of you are interested in uh, in seeing our uh, our chemistry lab, and so those who have uh, have time to stay for uh, a brief tour, uh, we can uh, meet out in the uh, uh, hallway here. Actually, we've got uh, safety glasses uh, right over there, uh, and if you could grab a pair of safety glasses and come on out, we can uh, uh, do that. I'd like to have a, a round of applause for all of our presenters today. And uh, thanks to Matt for uh, uh, hosting us.